Yes, so uh, let's start. Um, we talk about ESG from a very unique perspective. Uh, it's not about ESG strategy. So we cannot tell you what you can do better in your business to be, to be more sustainable. What we cover is how to measure your ESG performance and communicate that externally in a very effective way. Now, this is not PR or investor relations consulting. We don't, don't talk about uh, communication strategies. We really just talk about the facts. And in order to talk about the facts, we gathered about 10 uh, large Swiss companies, mostly stock quoted, that helped us with their needs, develop a method that is uh, comprehensive and efficient in communicating your ESG performance. And this is what I'm going to show you today. Uh, we had an objective. We wanted to identify all the metrics. We found that very important. And then we uh, wanted to know how to deal with those metrics so that they can be used in external reporting and in compensation. And uh, as a side effect, we also made some reporting recommendations. Today, I will uh, talk you through what we've learned when developing these ESG frameworks and go quickly then into uh, the question, why should you do that in the first place? And also, uh, uh, this is really an important aspect because you may hear that. People may tell you that, uh, well, they think this is just a fad and it's gonna go away. Then we'll introduce the metrics to you and our methods of uh, consolidating ESG performance. And we also have from an early client an illustration how your ESG performance could look. Let's go into what we've done. Uh, we gathered over 1200 metrics and we categorized them into uh, categories that are easy to digest for you when you have to work through this metrics list. And we mapped each of those important metrics uh, to GRI so that you can use your GRI index and you have everything at the right place. And outside organizations that use the GRI uh, uh, standard can quickly assess your performance. We've collected feedback in the process and we've developed the framework uh, that we could then provide to that early group of adopters. What have we learned? Um, one thing that is really important and may already give you a reason why you should ESG is that most of the ESG metrics today are not really doing good metrics. They are doing well metrics, which means that they're not really altruistic for someone else. They're really your future profit potential. This is different from your profit reporting, which tells you your past profit. It actually is an indication of your future pro uh, uh, profit. The second important thing is it's not about only about quantitative metrics. There are a lot, a lot of effort into reporting that is awarded as well by rating agencies and also by external parties like investors and customers. And despite these huge advantages that we found out, um, we realized that most companies, when it comes to the metrics they find most important, reduce uh, it to only a few metrics and they and make then those few metrics compensation relevant. We think that's insufficient. I will make the case today, but if you have more than just a handful of metric, it, metrics, it becomes necessary to have a method of consolidation. And that's what we have introduced with our ESG, ESG framework. We think there's an opportunity to use ESG in compensation and have a much better future-oriented incentive structure in place. We think that you should, that you can, there's also an opportunity, can put more emphasis on what you've actually done, not necessarily the outcome of that, because that may be later in time. And we believe that is that this will also help you reduce risk in the company, because measuring performance more broadly will act as an early warning indicator and guide you uh, towards the right future for you. And the last opportunity is we believe the method that we've developed uh, and that we then present as a triple bottom line graphic is really simple and intuitive. So let's start with the most important question. Why should you do ESG in the first place? You will hear that if you're in sustainability uh, or if you um, in um, uh, in compensation and want to introduce sustainability aspects in your compensation, many people though uh, may take it lightly and say like at the end of the day, profit counts and you will have 
you will need an answer because otherwise you're not taking serious are, are not taken seriously and my answer is this traditional profit reporting is what you see on the uh, left side of this picture uh, it basically starts with your income and it deducts a couple of cost components and arrives at a profit metric now this profit metric nowadays accounts for 50 to 80 percent of external communication and executive compensation uh, when it's about displaying your performance. But we believe that profit is a very ambiguous profit, uh, metric, a very ambiguous um, diluted metric of your actual performance. And uh, one, one uh, simple thing you see here, uh, while income is from the past, really, you, have, you can only generate income if you have developed the products in the past, uh, your production cost and your administration cost may be from the present, but many things that you actually do in the company are for the future, and you deduct that. So the less you do for the future, the higher your profit. And this is a, a big problem because profit is a little bit like happiness. You know, if you want to drink tea and you want more tea, you can drink more tea, but you cannot drink more happiness. And it's the same with profit. You know, you cannot increase profit directly. You have to develop new products. You have to make customers happy. Uh, and really, the only thing to influence uh, profit directly is by cutting cost. But that's not something that builds your future. So we believe instead of focusing on, on, on financial metrics to more than 50%, you know, we believe you should focus a lot more on the things that are called ESG, but are actually performance indicators for your future. So we have listed here the performance indicators that we've seen uh, uh, most prominent in executive compensation schemes. And you, you see here that most of these metrics that are listed here are actually investments into the future. You know, if you, if you invest in safety, employee development, I start out all the way down here with the employees, or if you have more happy employees, you will have a better future. Uh, as a company, this is not really about doing well, uh, doing good. It's really about having an economic benefit from your investments. Uh, it's even more clear with customers. The net promoter score is your future profit. Again, satisfaction, business quality has been used as, as metrics in DSG compensation schemes. And then the most important one, the environment, you know, you could there say like, well, this is a cost component, but it may actually give you a competitive advantage in the future. So even there, I believe it makes a lot of sense to talk about your, comp about your company performance in a much more broader way, as illustrated here on the right side, um, with all the acronyms that are used today from ESG uh, over social, uh, corporate social responsibility, all the way down to people, profit, and planet. We believe if you want to present yourself in a good light, and if you want to have the right incentives in the company, it makes a lot of sense to make ESG a priority in performance measurement. This is my case. I like to use that graphic. And normally when I do a workshop with that, it takes at least an hour because everybody discusses if that is correct or not. At the end of the day, uh, at one point, people will realize that they want ESG or, or cannot avoid it, uh, to say the least. And then the question is, how should you do that? One way of, um, of, of doing ESG is just to rely on external rating agencies. And I think that's wrong. You know, one of the hope was that external rating agencies will at one point um, agree on how they rate companies. And then when you're good there, you've mastered your ESG channel challenge. I think that conversion of ESG ratings will never happen for one simple reason. These rating agencies have very different histories. Some come from the area of governance and compensation. Other come from the area of the environment. And again, other have multiple interests and some, as Richemont, focus on the social aspects of ESG performance. Now, if you have a different mission for your ESG rating, your ESG rating will be different. So for me, it's not a surprise that the rating agencies cannot agree at all on the ratings of a certain company because very simple, their missions differ. And we can see that very well 
uh, with, with this um, chart that I found recently in a Swiss newspaper where the ratings from Refinitiv on the vertical axis, which is a long stock exchange company, uh, were compared to the ratings of Sustainalytics for Swiss companies. And you can see that they don't agree at all. You know, these ratings in order to agree would have to uh, lie on that middle diagonal. You know, this is when they agree. And when they're down here, takes Group, for instance, has a, a ranking in Sustainalytics that on, on the very low end, while uh, uh, for Refinitiv, it's very high, you know? Here it's around 15, here it's about 80. And Nestle is the other way around, very low rating on the Refinitiv, but um, in um, uh, Sustainalytics, Nestle is very good. So even for a large company like Nestle, where, where you would think they must agree on the performance metrics, we do not have agreement. And we see that again and again, and it's been in the meantime proven with statistical analysis by researchers that these rating agencies uh, cannot be used for your performance assessment because their vision, mission, and values differ from yours. And on top of that, the rating agencies are not the only ones. You know, there are there's the media, there are the customer, there are customers, there are investors, the regulators, uh, all these different parties that also need to assess your performance. And if these companies, stakeholders make their assessment, they will mo most likely not rely on another third party. They will make their own assessments. And for that reason, we believe it's fundamental that a company comes up with their own ESG rating. So it's not going to be something that can be compared to others, but it's your own assessment of how well you do. And it's your own justification how well you are, how good you are. <laughs> Know how well you are. So when we come to that, you know, the question is really, how do I assess my own ESG performance? How that is done today is that companies focus on two to three metrics. And we believe this is not the right thing to do. Uh, when we looked at these uh, 1,200 metrics and consolidated them into categories, we found a little bit more than 30 categories that we found important. And these categories that we use uh, in that long list of ESG metrics is shown here. What we've done is we've used bigger areas like environmental when the metric is more important, or the category is more important. And we, you know, mentally, we didn't use Richemont where the social aspect may be very important because there's not much of an environmental impact. Um, we used an industrial company where uh, the social impact on the governance impact is less fundamental than the environmental impact. So we had this you know, Swiss manufacturing company in mind when we looked at that and we believed, okay, this company, if they wanna, if they wanna communicate their performance well, they should be presenting exactly that picture and how well they're doing in these aspects. Now, when you look at that and you think, um, what metrics actually make money for the company, it's surprisingly how many of these aspects are actually at one point profit relevant. Uh, there's only very little things in ESG today that is not really a proxy for your own economic performance. So it's really in the interest of that typical industrial company to present the full picture. But how much do they actually present? And we looked at a couple of selected industrial companies. Uh, we looked at Siemens, for instance, and we looked at the um, metrics they mentioned in their executive compensation report. And we learned that they have only three metrics. So Siemens basically looks at carbon emissions, but not at any other emission, by the way. So they only look at the part of emissions. Then they look at the net promoter score, which is, um, which is a customer need, but they're not looking at customer satisfaction. And they're looking at employees only in terms of how much do we train them? Safety for an industrial company like Siemens is not part of their ESG. It's quite surprising. So you can really see how punctual, uh, how uh, selective it is to only use three metrics. But some companies are even worse. ADB just uses safety. ADB is a competitor of Siemens. They use something else, but then still even less compared to Siemens. Credit Suisse um, has a very strong focus on the governance and social issues. Uh, customer service is important, tele, uh, talent management diversity is important, 
So it's a little bit more, but again, if you look at any of these metrics, it really is only a part of the whole category that they're covering. Roche focuses on the environment and diversity, for some reason not on health um, or customer health, uh, which, which might be interesting. So again, we have a company that is not really using anything representative, uh, representative of their priorities. And finally, Swisscom has reduced their uh, ESG-related metric to just the net promoter score. So I think you know if you if you saw that that graphic before, where um, you see lots of categories, thirty categories, and each one of them has at least three to five metrics. So we're talking about one hundred and twenty to two hundred metrics. That uh, when you look at them, you will see that they are relevant to you, I, even uh, if you just take a, you know a fraction of that. Um, it's already a lot of metrics, and the question that we then faced was how can we Get that under control. And we developed a, a method based on uh, assessing the performance of each metric individually a, as an achievement. And this is really the next thing I want to show you. You have to reduce the complexity of your ESG reporting. You cannot give them the 200 metrics. And when we then looked at uh, these metrics individually, and you don't have to do screenshots or anything, you'll get the PDF afterwards of this presentation. So uh, we identified a couple of problems. The first one was, let's assume you want to go from 100,000 tons of CO2 to zero tons in 2030. The problem is that you know you may be somewhere at eighty-five thousand in the first year, you know, uh, but that doesn't really look good. You know, you're at twenty percent of your target. You know, you want to reduce hundred thousand. You've only reduced fifteen thousand. You know, what do we do when we're far away from the target? This is this is really an important point. The second problem was then, let's assume that the target is not zero. Uh, maybe. The target is uh, could be recycling, could go from 0% to 100%, but actually 80% is already good. What do you do when your target is below the maximum? You know, If you then assess that you're below the maximum, but you've already achieved the target that you find useful, you may think that even 80% is already 100% performance. So this was, this was the most fundamental problems that I saw. Uh, you can also see here um, uh, some, uh, something else. You know, another other aspect is uh, we had that also with the carbon uh, performance. You cannot do more than zero emissions. You cannot do more than 100% renewable energy. So basically, whenever there is something, whenever <laughs> somebody um, drives a car, you're not at zero emissions anymore. You're below it. And does that mean you're always below target? You know, now we have to solve that. On the other hand, you know, recycling, it could be that already 20% recycling of your uh, products or of your um, uh, supplies is good. Now, if 20% is already what you want to achieve and you said this is 100% achievement, what do you do if you exceed that target? You know, will it go all the way up to um, 500%, you know, 20% is 100, 40 is 200, et cetera? Um, or, so we have to think about how, what we do with overshooting the target. You know, what do we do with a given percentage? Is it always better or do you reach a, tar a maximum at 50% women in management? And finally, um, uh, we have the problem with every metric. Uh, it's here on the left side that you, when you know the target, how do you set the minimum and the maximum, you know, so that you're not always at 100% or like at the maximum performance here, it's 200% or at the minimum performance because the metric fluctuates too much for your uh, achievement function. Again, we had to find solutions, how we uh, uh, define the interval between minimum and maximum. And finally, uh, also something here that you see on the right si side, if you go from those, those 100,000 to zero, you know, this is not gonna be linear. You know, sometimes, a target can be achieved or progress in a target can be achieved quite quickly at the beginning, huh? like weight loss goes fast at the beginning and then it takes a long time, you know, and then other side, you know, with other times, 
you know, let's build up your uh, running uh, skills, you know, in a for a marathon, it will start slowly. And then maybe at one point uh, it will go faster because, you know, your body is, is used to that. So we found these problems basically and uh, had to look for solution to these problems. In summary, it's a minefield. And uh, what, we, what we do is we, we, we recommend that you don't uh, show the metric that you've seen before. You don't show the tons. You don't show the liters of water wasted. You don't show the chiles of electricity used. What you show is uh, an achievement of your performance. And this is uh, really what we've done with our triple line framework. We call it the triple bottom line framework for people, profit, and planet. What you see here uh, is the final result of many iterations of trying to optimize the way we display performance. We came from down here, basically. You know, we know that there are tons, that there are percentages, the leaders, there's child, you know, whatever. And we know that the rating agencies convert that into letters from A to D, basically. There's no F, interesting enough, in ESG rating. <laughs> it's not exactly the school grades. Um, typically, most companies use that. Some have a AAA, others have an A plus, an A minus. Uh, they all use letters. And uh, we believe this is not a good way of displaying performance. It doesn't really uh, come across intuitively. What we recommend, what we have developed and now recommend is uh, some sort of uh, an achievement scale. And the simplest achievement scale that I found most intuitive in my 20 years of compensation consulting was to use a scale from 0% to 200% where 100% is target achieved. It's very intuitive. It has a cap as required. There is a floor. And I believe if you say you're at 100%, you know, and this corresponds to a B, let's say, uh, or uh, maybe just a B minus, because, you know, you cannot go higher than that. I think the 100% achievement is the much better value to communicate externally, because external parties will have difficulties to understand that, that letter. I, I have a customer who has a B minus in their carbon footprint or in their environmental impact, and they are the best on their, of their industry. You know, a third part, I mean, for an ESG expert, this is intuitive. They say like, oh, in this industry, you cannot be better than B minus, but actually for everybody else, it's completely confusing because uh, people think relative. And if they say like, okay, who's the best in auto manufacturing when it comes to CO2 footprint, they're, they're not so interested that the auto industry is one that has a big environmental impact. They're more interested what company does the best? What company is the best in class? And the scale from 0% to 200% allows you to display 100% performance when you reach something that is a meaningful target in your industry. Now, this uh, performance uh, graph is called a waterfall chart. Um, we, we ended up with this waterfall chart for a couple of reasons. One is you can easily identify the contributions on different aspects of ESG. And what you see here is actually implemented with a German client that we have. So for them, carbon innovation, gender materials, and, and water is our important performance indicators. And you can see now directly how they all contribute to an overall company performance. So each one of them individually is a contribution. How do we get to this graph? First of all, we measure the performance in the, the left side here on the graph. We, performance, we measure performance uh, on that similar, on that same scale. scale. We, we, we measure CO2 carbon, not in tons, it's 0% to 200% target achievement. Same for innovation, gender materials and water. And the result then uh, is, is an average for the total company. So this is another way how you could display your performance by individually you know, showing the bars. The problem is that if you believe in your company, um, innovation is the most important target and should be actually weighted higher. If you'd like to add a weight, and we've heard that often that there's a desire to you know, split, let's say three metrics in, into 50%, 25% and 25% and not necessarily equally into one third each. So if you want to use weights, uh, you can use that with the waterfall chart. 
Here, this is weighted, currently equally weighted so that you see the same result. But if we had a weighted innovation higher, well, no, then but that doesn't have an impact because that's exactly 100%. But if we weighted a water higher than the rest, the orange bar would come down because the contribution of uh, materials, sorry, materials uh, uh, more, then the overall performance comes down because materials is an underperformance. If we overweight carbon, the orange bar will go up because carbon is an over uh, target uh, contribution. So the advantage of that waterfall chart that I recommend you know, include in your uh, annual report is uh, to use uh, this type of thinking, uh, which allows you to much more intuitively communicate your triple bottom line. The good thing about this achievement chart that you have here on the right side is that you can convert that directly into uh, compensation. So you see on the left side, again, the same chart uh, as before. And in this case, the company had 144% ESG achievement. You can actually just change the scale of your vertical axis from percentages to multiples of your target bonus and say, 100% target achievement is one times target bonus. And it goes all the way up to two times target bonus and it starts at zero times target bonus. So without having to explain in detail how the bonus is calculated, you, you just tell them you change the axis and that's it. Makes it very simple at the end of the day. By the way, 140%, 44% ESG achievement is not that untypical. Uh, we did now a couple of compensation projects where we had to do a target calibrations. You know, what is a meaningful target? And I have clients that are with me for 10 years and uh, some of them are really tough with their, with their targets when it comes to financial performance. And they've become very, very lenient with ESG performance. So I think that's intuitive, you know, because on the profit, you, you have less compromise than on ESG. The result is, that the target setting typically in ESG will be softer than in financial performance, which helps you make your compensation uh, more resilient. You know, you're more likely to uh, approve, uh, achieve your ES an ESG outperformance. And if you then, you know, add that together, the likelihood of not paying anything to your employees or of paying too much decreases because you have more metrics and one of that metric, the ESG metric, is, is a lot more stable than the financial metrics are in practice. It's basically here, uh, these 1200 metrics uh, turned into a metric structure with different types, with the categories, and most importantly, any metric that we found important, we assigned a GRI code, uh, because that makes it a lot easier for rating agencies and also investors to uh, put your ESG performance into their um, assessment, uh, into their computers, into their database so that they can assess your ESG performance. We think about 400 of those 1200 metrics are unique and feasible to use in ESG performance measurement. And uh, from that, we created the short list of about 170 metrics that are uh, useful in compensation. That's not just quantitative metrics. You don't have to use 170. There are also achievement metrics. And this is something important. Let's say um, you realize that you need uh, a diversity policy, for instance, or a, or a training policy, uh, which you typically already have. Uh, so, uh, but that has to be made available to the public so that you know there is one and uh, it, it contains these and these steps. You know, that's already work, you know, of course. And, and you may have a couple of things to do over the next three to five years so that your performance is better and more efficiently communicated to your uh, audiences outside the company. So these efforts can actually also go into compensation saying, if you achieve all these things and they're all done, then our targets are achieved. So even if you start, you know, very low and, you know, you have a long way to go, um, the first steps that maybe not are, that may not be quantifiable at the beginning already can be communicated as an ESG performance. So this is the 170 metrics that we believe are important for compensation. And uh, when I summarize all that, um, 
uh, the, the framework, you know, what it now includes, it, it's really a list of all these metrics. And, and the important thing, the consolidation methods to arrive at an overall company performance, like shown in the triple bottom line charts. The method of linking ESG performance executive pay is now very simple, <laughs> but there are still a few, you know, caveats that we may have to discuss. Uh, but most importantly, because we have now more than a dozen companies that work with us on ESG topics, uh, we want to distribute best practices in this area uh, between people that work with the ES ESG framework. And for that reason, we, um, we make webinars probably, you know, one or two a year, roughly is the idea, but also an annual event where you meet other people work, uh, working on the same issue. So this is really what you know, this, this ESG framework includes at this moment in time that we believe is beneficial for the next couple of years. What you then can do in your company uh, is you can do your own ESG index or ESG triple bottom line. That is a lot more uh, effectively in communication and it is a lot easier to, to link to executive pay. And finally, uh, we believe it's important to have someone to ask for support, and that would also be included in that ESG framework. This really concludes um, uh, the message, how I think ESG performance measurement and executive compensation can be dramatically improved uh, over today's um, typical practices. And most importantly, will help you manage your company more towards the future, more towards growth than towards cost cutting, which really comes from overweighting profit metrics in your performance. So ESG will make your performance statement forward looking. And if you link that to performance uh, to executive compensation, it will incentivize your employees broadly to work for the future. Thank you.